from EastEnders who played Barry Clark back in the 80s. How, hello, Car uh, Gary. How are you, mate? You I'm all right, mate. How are you? Yeah, good. Very good. Thank you. How are you coping with lockdown? Uh, yeah, I guess the same as everybody else. Mm. Um, Just it's, getting on with it, biting the bullet. Yeah, it's been a horrible year and I'm... I, Can't I, wait for it to be over. You know, I, I still get out and about. I'm still with work and various things and stuff. So I still get out and I still see people, which is nice. And, Great stuff. Um, I'm now glad that being in London, we're not in that, you know, we're allowed to go to shops and stuff like that again. So it's, it's oh, good. A good. Bit normal. Uh, so it's improving so slowly like, but surely. Yeah. I feel I'm so hoping this time next lonely. year will it all be a distant memory, I hope. Oh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, because it has been. I didn't expect it to go on this long, but here we are. No, me either. Right, well, Gary, uh, first of all, obviously, thank you for agreeing to this and joining me. Are you ready for your first question? I, uh, yeah, I guess. Yes. OK, well, I'm going to take you right back to before EastEnders, because I wanted to start the interview uh, by chatting about a role you played prior to EastEnders in another classic series, Grange Hill. So I just wanted to ask, was that your first TV role? And did you ever meet the show's creator, Phil Redmond? Uh, it wasn't my first TV role, no. I, start, I went to a place called the Anna Scher Theatre in Islington and I started TV work when I was like 10 or 11. Did you go, can I, sorry, picking up on that, did you go at the same time as Linda Robson and Pauline Quirk? Phil I did, they were there, they were a little bit older than I was, so they were kind of in a higher class, but I was there with Sue Tully, Lee McDonald, uh, a whole bunch of other people, Dexter Fletcher, I was wow. there, me, Graham Fletcher, there were a whole bunch of people, and a lot of which I'm still in touch with, and I've stayed in touch with and I am with many of the more, uh, the, the later students. I've just worked with uh, a lovely lady called Annie Birkin, who's a brilliant actress and a wonderful playwright. And I worked with her a couple of years ago mm. uh, on a play. And that, again, is still from Anna's. So that, that whole thing still has an effect on my life now. Oh, great. Phil Redmond, I didn't meet Phil Redmond while I was doing Grange Hill. I did meet Phil Redmond uh, earlier than that when he was doing a show way back when, I think it was called Going Out. And it was a, a really, really kind of cool show about teenage, uh, older teenagers uh, leaving school and, and stuff like that. Mm. And myself and five or six other people from Anna Scherz were asked to read the scripts and comment on them. And I think I was like 11 or something at the time. It was not aimed at me. Mm. And most of the other people were a little bit older. But we got to sit with Phil and chat about the script. And uh, he actually listened. He was really interested in what everyone had to say and really took it all on board, he was furiously making notes and, and- Very nurturing. Really, really interested in, in our comments. Mm. Um, and a really nice guy, very, very laid back. Mm. Very, very laid back. And mm. yeah, very talented guy as well. Yeah. And very That's cool. Very cool. Well, I, saw, I posted a clip of uh, you on Grain Hill the other day. Oh, um, life out of me. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how long did you stay in Grain Hill? Uh, we, we, I, I did it with Gary Love. We were kind of like a double act. And uh, the season before season six, I think I'd done an episode in that or, or perhaps episode five, I can't remember, uh, season five, I can't remember, it was one or the other. Um, but they had Mark Savage playing Gripper, which was... Oh, yes. Now, um, it's so tame, but at the time it was so controversial and so yeah. really hard-hitting TV. And, and Mark, I know, took a lot of stick for, for playing... He was a real nasty bully, wasn't he? Yeah, and they, they, in the end, they had to expel him. Uh, and Gary and I, Gary Love and I, were brought on as kind of more gentle, kind of almost comedy school bullies. Not quite, but a little bit more of a light side to them. They were quite confident in themselves, weren't they? And they were running gambling rackets or something, weren't they? Your character. Uh, there was something like that at some point. It's been a while since I've it. It's just been released on DVD and I know a friend of mine just watched them all and keeps sending me bits and laughing hysterically. At, oh. <laughs> apart from anything else, my hair. That seems to be the, the thing he laughs at the moment. Oh. Oh, were you in it with George when George Wilson? Because I had George Wilson on um, uh, last month. Uh, were you no, in it with George Wilson? He's, he's way younger than me, I'm afraid. Um, oh, right. OK. So I think he came in 1985 and you were 1983, weren't you? I was 80. I, we filmed it all in 83 and it went out at the end of 83 and then over into 84. So, mm. um, that was great. It's brilliant fun. Uh, well, I've just got to ask you, because just before we um, came on air, we were just talking about the bill. And now this was before EastEnders. You were in the very first episode of The Bill, which was called... 
No, it was called Wooden Top. It yes. Was, um, that, it, that's, again, it's that, that a long time ago. Was, like, you can't remember. If I'd have known this beforehand, I would have dug that clip out. Um, well, it's, um, it was me and a guy from Grand Hill, a guy called Paul McKenzie, who's also in Grand Hill, and again, both from Anna Shares. They were doing six pilots for Thames at the time, Thames TV or ITV, one or the other, I can't remember which. Mm. And Wooden Top was one of the pilots. And there was a, a, a the plan was to pr show these six pilots and pick up the ones that worked. And I, I, I know it was more than one that got picked up, but the bill got picked up from that and became a, an hour drama series. And then eventually, you know, more and more. And sadly, I, and I still don't really understand why they stopped the bills. I, yeah, I really did. I, I, I thought it was something that would go on, you know. And on. it should have. It was a great show, great characters. Mm. Um, and actually when I filmed the bill, Peter Dean was the sergeant, which was then later played by Eric Cryack, I believe. No way, I didn't know that. Peter played that originally. Really? And this was all before EastEnders, wasn't it? 1983, did you say? Oh, yeah, 1980 and something, yeah. It was yeah. Before Grange you don't. I won't pressure you for yeah. dates and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to... Uh, I think I know we filmed it in Wimbledon, uh, not Wimbledon. Over near, we had to get the, the tube from uh, the train from Waterloo out to somewhere southwest, which seemed like a very, very long way uh, at the time. And I must must have been when I was sixteen, because otherwise I'd have been driving. Mm. Okay, so I'm just okay. taking you back there a little bit. <laughs> okay, well, question two is it's a two part question. Okay, can you recall School. how your audition for EastEnders came about? And can you actually remember your audition? Because did you have to read with uh, Michael Cashman, who played your partner, Colin? Uh, do I remember it? Oh, God, yeah, absolutely, I remember it. You must have been so nervous. Vividly. Um, I, I, I think it all came about... Uh, when Julia and Tony, I met them a year or two before, probably in around 84, towards the end of 1984, I was doing a TV... Uh, Years ago, I mean, I don't know if they still do them now, but they had schools programs. Oh, God, yeah. The schools program, and in that schools program was Gordon Kay, Sandy Ratcliffe, um, uh, Michelle Collins, um, I can't remember who else, a couple of other people, uh, and myself. And Julia and Tony visited the set, mm. and they were very interested in chatting to us. And originally, so I believe, and, and, and so things were going, they were interested in seeing me for the part of Mark. Uh, when oh, right. Cast EastEnders. I was actually down in Wales working on a uh, film for BBC Screen Two, which was called Contact. Mm -hmm. And we were down there being paratroopers and, you know, in this, with an amazing director called Alan Clark. So oh, I, Alan Clark, yes. I'd, I'd met um, Julia and Tony and kind of got to know them earlier than that. Um, about six months before. Barry, I, I went up to Elstree and had an audition for another part, which didn't work out. And, and I got the call from to go and see Julia and Tony at, at Shepherd's Bush on, it was a Friday afternoon. Mm. And I'll never forget, I was working in an office in the West End and I was really, it was very, oh, it was a very odd, it was very, not, nervous is not the right word. There was just excited and, and Surreal. It, it, it was the show by that point was phenomenal. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. You can't imagine that there, there are no shows that are uh, it, the same now because there are so many channels back then. We had just four channels. Yes. Five mm -hmm. there were just four. And, you know, EastEnders and Coronation Street was huge. Everybody watched them, you mm. know, and everybody then spoke about them the next day. So it was, it was really big news and really kind of, in that sense, it was kind of scary. Mm. Julia and Tony were brilliant. They really put me at ease. Instantly, I was the first one to go in and be seen in the afternoon. They gave me the script and they gave me this kind of like parent-like talk um, about, you know, what the character was. And at that point, Michael's character, Colin, hadn't been, for want of a better word, outed. In this yes. Still, you know, they, they, they shared all this incompetence. And, said, and had this conversation with me about, you know, if I were to take the role, you know, I would need to, you know, consider these things and the impact and all the rest of it. And as a, 
a 20 year old, I'd, this was going in one ear and out the other. I mean, it, it, if I got the role I was doing, that was the end of it. Mm. Um, I, I read for it, I, I read the scene, um, which I think you may have put up as a clip where I, I come into the room and there's the whole massage to shoulders and then there's the- Yes, the so that was that's what your I very read. first scene. That was what I read for the audition. Um, oh, no way. They asked me to um, come back at four o'clock, which was the worst thing. I think I, I was in at one and they said, could I come back at four? Oh. Um, and I spent an afternoon in Shepherd's Bush, uh, absolutely just spending money because I had to do something. And I, yeah, you were just bored. I just been paid. Work, that three working. hours felt like a lifetime. <laughs> it really did. I'd just been paid that afternoon. Um, I was working in an office doing market research, which I used to love, great bunch of people. Um, and I spent all this money, went back at four o'clock, by which time I was really nervous, by which time I'd really kind of wound myself up quite You've a lot. You've been thinking about it all that time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's unusual to be asked to go back that quickly. Mm. Um, and I went back at four o'clock. Uh, and this time the talk was more serious um, about, you know, if we offer this and if, you know, you consider doing this, you need to think about all of these conversations and all of the negative things that could happen as a result. And they were very genuine and very sincere about it. Mm. And they also said, you know, you would need to speak to your family and you would need to have a conversation with them about it. And, and all of this really was not, I guess, the only way I can say is I must have been much more naive than I would have thought I was at 20 because mm. I could not see the issue. And that's quite genuine. I'm not trying to be coy and say, oh, look at me, I know one of I really couldn't yeah. see the issue. I'd been working in television since I was 11. The idea of somebody being gay was not a big deal. Mm. I, it hadn't been. In fact, I, you, you know, I, I, it just was so ordinary in my mind. Mm. It didn't mean anything. But that's, you know, because of what you used to living in London and and working in that that kind of field in that industry and I, I, I clearly was quite naive I guess. Uh, I went back and uh, I had to go to, I had a class at the Anna Shirty that evening so mm. I got home just before half five and I needed to rush out to get to the class which was at six and I was in such a state, quite genuinely a real physical state on the bus going down there um, that I actually got off the bus two stops too early because I just couldn't sit still anymore. I absolutely was just a mess. And I almost decided that nothing should make you feel that bad. Mm. That if this didn't work out, I was just going to jack it in and really pursue uh, what I was doing at the time, this market research thing that I was enjoying and all the rest of it. And I got to the Anna Shea Theatre, and this will mean very little to most people, but uh, Anna's husband, Charles, uh, they worked as partnership. Charles was kind of the business guy. Oh, right, yeah. Straight laced, tall, very, uh, very just straight laced guy. You know, he's very um, calm and never did anything over the top. And as I walked in, he started singing the EastEnders thing. Yeah. Soon the, the whole thing came together and it was very out of character for him. And it was just, it was wonderful to be told, not only on the same day that I'd had the audition, which was great to me, I didn't have to spend a weekend nervous as hell. No. But, it was in front of the class of, of friends who were all so pleased for me. Oh, wow. It was just so nice. There was not a, you know, a real nice moment. So happy for me. Uh, and it was, you know, it's, it's a very fond memory and a very, uh, something I'll treasure forever. You know, it was a great experience, a great day, uh, albeit a little tense. At, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was more coffee now. Yes, you can have some more coffee. Well, it all worked out well for the end. In the end, didn't it? Okay, so am I going into too much detail? I'm not no, no, you you carry on. It's interesting. This is because question three is: What was your first day on set like? Uh, it was brilliant. I, I, again, I was quite nervous because, as I said, the show was phenomenal at the time. Mm. Um, Michael very quickly took me under his wing. Um, uh, you know, I met Michael. I don't actually remember being introduced to Michael. It's really bizarre because I just feel like I kind of knew him. And I remember him being very supportive. And right from the get go, uh, you know, I wrote something on the Twitter feed in the week about how Michael's generous. And he, he, he very kindly said ditto. I, he was 
beyond generous. My first day, he was filling me full of confidence and energy and, and support and made that day so much easier for me. Mm. I'm lucky enough that most of the f- first stuff I did was, was the wink. That was the first day. We filled oh, up. yes, where he nearly falls off his bike, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was with Gillian Taufel, who was on the stall next to Barry's stall. So I knew yeah. her and I knew her sister both very, very well. So that was made my life a lot easier. Mm. Michael was so good at making sure I knew everybody, making sure I knew where to go, and really just looking after me and making sure that, you know, at your first day, it's like first day at school. Of course, yeah. It's not just like a first day at school. It's, it's like a first day at school when you've moved to a new area and everybody else has already got their friends. Yes. It's, everybody's kind of there and done. And, uh, and uh, we've been friends ever since. Um, That's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really do. It was a brilliant day. And I remember Julia coming up at the end of the day and saying, thank you. That was a great first day. Oh, oh which must have made you right. feel much better. I, it, was, it was great. It was very exciting and very, uh, you know, I think that was the first night that I got home and probably had some proper sleep because all of that kind of run up and tension and... and yes. <laughs> relief. Um, yeah. And then, well, well, you've answered my question because the next one I was going to ask was about, um, yeah, it was just basically to say about the wonderful chemistry that you and Michael Cashman had, but we'll go back to that afterwards. I'm just going to, uh, because the, the questions I've got for you, they start off quite uh, just relating to the show and then we go into the more serious things <laughs> about uh, the press and public reaction to your story. Um, <laughs> But would you mind playing this little thing that I'm, I've got? Basically, um, I'm going to throw some legendary EastEnders names at you that were in it during your time on the show. And if you could just tell us briefly about memories you have of them or <laughs> any scenes you may have had with them. So the first one I'm going to go for is Wendy Richard, Pauline Fowler, who played Pauline Fowler. I have, and it's, again, as a result of Michael, I had the biggest crush on Wendy when she was in Are You Being Served growing up. Like, oh yeah, well she was lovely, wasn't she? Biggest crush ever. I mean, just like unbelievable. And I, I had kind of half sort of mentioned to Michael that I was really kind of looking forward to meeting her and whatever. And uh, I met Wendy, he introduced me to Wendy and all I can say, uh, and I'm not going to have this because it's a very personal memory and, and it, it just wouldn't, somehow wouldn't be right to share, but she was, so much more than I could have even wished for as a person. Yeah. Loved her to bits. Really, she was just so down to earth and so, she was fantastic. I really, really, really was so pleased I got to meet her and got to work with her and, and stayed in touch, uh, you know, after I'd left the show and she came to a play that I was in and, and oh. took out of me and, and stuff. And she, I, I've got a lot of time. I will share the story with you off air but I really can't it wouldn't be right on air I'm really sorry okay but well, you can privately message me that because I'm intrigued I'll, I'll, now <laughs> I will privately okay message I'll, I'll be interested person. to see if Michael remembers that'll be quite funny I'll, ah I'll, yes yes because it wouldn't have had the same impact on him as it did me because it was my first ever meeting of her and I'll never ever forget it as long as I live oh wow well, I've got to hear this though <laughs> okay the next name Peter Dean, who played Pete Beale, because he lives near you now, doesn't he? Pete and I are good, good mates. We don't see each other as often as we as we should and could. Um, and he often visits where I live. Uh, I've got a neighbour about 15, 20 doors up. Mm. And their family are very good friends with Peter. I'd known Peter from the Bill earlier than that, um, or wouldn't talk was it when we'd done it. Uh, and I think I'd worked with him in something else as well, because we did know each other. Um, I can't remember. Then we must have been something else. Uh, 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 Peter's just Peter. He's um, a very friendly guy. He, uh, he's a very funny guy, for a really good character and, and a good mate. You know, mm. I like Peter, got a lot of time for him. Well, please do tell him. He's very welcome for me to I, interview him. It's on my note. When I, t- when I run into him, I will definitely tell him. The only thing is, he'll probably have to come around here and do this Zoom meeting, because I imagine he probably, well, I don't know, maybe not giving him the credit he deserves. Uh, he's well, probably going to do Zoom better than I can, to be really honest, thinking about it. Well, I don't know. I'm not any, I've been doing Zoom for a couple of months now, and I'm no good at it. Look, after <laughs> quite a few disasters, I tell you, with Zoom, but we won't tempt faith. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, this is going to work. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. The next one, 
Gillian Tailforth, who of course played Kathy Beale, because I think she, this is a compliment to her, obviously she looks amazing. And I, watching those early episodes now, um, her son, she, I mean, she looks like she's in her 20s. She doesn't look, Ian would have been 16 in the at the very beginning or your era, around that age anyway, wouldn't, wouldn't he? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, yeah, I guess he would have been. Um, she doesn't look old enough to have her uh, son no, that age. She still doesn't look old enough. No, she doesn't. <laughs> Compliment yeah, I, to Again, her, I, I, knew, I knew Jilly before I did EastEnders, so I knew her and Sue Tully really well from Anna Scherz. Um, and Jilly, I don't know if you've ever had the good fortune of meeting her, and it really no. is good fortune to get to meet her. She's such a bubbly person. She was... Um, I think if I remember right, her and Nick would date. Nick Berry were dating at the time, um, so they were. Kind of funny. I, you know, the, I didn't I, know that. I was fairly public knowledge. It was. I'm not. Oh, I was too young for all of that. Um, then I wouldn't have paid attention. But oh wow, Nick Berry. But yeah, yeah, we ended up hanging out quite a lot. Um, you know, and, and actually, did Jilly, a couple of times because where she drove to work, and if my car was in dock or something like that, she'd drop by and pick me up. So that was yeah. That's she, nice. Um, it's a shame she's not on social media because I'd like to invite her to one of these interviews. Uh, is she not? Not in any way, shape? No. Um, she might be on Facebook, but I've tried to search for her on Twitter and I've, there is a fan page for her. Um, I mean, if I, if, I meet, if I meet up with her or if I hook up with her, I will definitely pass on your details. Oh, please do. I'd love to speak to her. Okay. Well, the next one. Oh, yes. Letitia Dean, who played Sharon Watts. Uh, Tish, still there. I met the night before I did my audition for EastEnders. I and I didn't know Tish at the time. I bumped into Letitia Dean and Susan Tully at oh, I think it was the Hippodrome in the West End. Okay. You know, I still go out to clubs in the West End way back when. Um, and that was the first time I met her. And, and Tish was great. Again, I mean, I, I. I don't think there's anyone I didn't like on the cast, to yeah. be really honest. I think uh, uh, everybody was so friendly. It was it was not a massive cast, but it was quite an intimate, and quite a friendly, and quite a supportive cast. There was a, a it was a very high profile show, and there were all sorts of people having all sorts of problems as a result of being in a high profile show. Mm. Well, I, I say problems, they're problems we'd all like to have, I suppose, in some respects. But uh, so there was a great kind of camaraderie and a, a, a a family atmosphere and a, a kind of family feeling at, at least isn't i i would say the, the first day i went into uh the rehearsal rooms as opposed to the lot um and I, I was again quite nervous and sat into the green room waiting and i knew sue and i knew various other people there are a lot of people i didn't know but mm. everybody was just really friendly um and really welcoming and you did kind of leave at the end of the day feeling like you've been there forever and, mm. and it, it just had that kind of vibe about it. Well, the last two names I, were gonna, I was going to mention, but you've kind of answered the questions anyway, but I had to mention these two because they were, well, they still are, as far as I'm concerned, the king and queen of the Queen Vic. I uh, thought that Leslie was me Gra and Michael. <laughs> yeah, well, you as well, but also <laughs> Leslie Grant and Anita Dobson as Den and Angie. Because uh, the whole era with Den and Angie was... Um, legendary i mean you were in the um christmas day episode where it was watched by 30 million people when den yeah. served angie the divorce papers that was pretty phenomenal to mm, be it was i seem to recall i could be wrong on this but i seem to recall that on when i first started i think they were not around because they were in i think it was uh, venice venice and I, I think they were filming that or 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 with the timeline they weren't on the stuff that i was doing on the square and stuff so i met them later um anita just bundled laughs I, I you know i again i just loved it the bits she was fun i got to do odds and sods with her she was a great great character angie was fantastic uh, she'd be great in a gay bar i've got to say angie <laughs> <laughs> yeah she'd be great <laughs> We got to jive and dance in the Christmas episode, which was fun. Yes, she was taking the cap off your head and yeah. Yeah, uh, and I still wear a cap like that and I still go out jiving. It's really quite sad. Nothing's changed. Oh, I'm the same. <laughs> uh, Leslie, yeah, Leslie was um, Leslie was a, a regular guy. I mean, I know he's much older than I was, so I didn't have as much to do with him. And I didn't have, in, in the same way that I had a, a kind of history with Peter, I knew him. So I, I kind of, I, I, I knew Peter better than I did Leslie. But Leslie, again... 
well, uh, you know, working guys doing what they can and and yeah, he was a very friendly guy. He wasn't he didn't wasn't aloof or, or anything like that. Mm. He had a very dry sense of humour. Uh, I've heard uh, about that. I know he yeah. didn't Pam St. Clements walk in to the crowd. I don't know if you were there or not, but Pam St. Clements walked on set or something, and apparently he turned around to her and said, Oh, look, it's the beach whale or something. And uh, yeah. Oh, I wasn't there, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, she found it funny. She recalled this story just sadly after he died and she was just, she was laughing about it of course um but i've got to say one thing i'm so glad that anita dobson is still with brian may because i do remember that lots of people were saying oh no 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 they won't last and here they are all these years later so they they have lasted. i mean they started going out when 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 we were doing eastenders i think if i remember oh right. wow did you ever meet him did he ever come on set I did meet brian may on one occasion which is why i'm thinking in fact on more than one occasion so i'm thinking it must have been around that time mm. And I remember him being a really nice guy and really, you know, he's this huge star and he was just so humble and sh almost shy and quiet and reserved. He, he comes across as that in interviews. Yeah, 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 he was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I got to meet some very cool people in my time, to be fair. You did, and you sound like you've got a great cast to work with, so brilliant. Okay, ah, right, well, number question number six is, in June 1987, Barry's screen brother, Graham, arrived, played by Gary Webster, before Minder. Um, I honestly thought his character would hit the roof and beat up Colin or something like that, uh, but pleasantly surprised when the brother was actually really cool about it. So can you tell us a bit about working with Gary Webster and those scenes? Well, I, as a direct result of this, and I, I kind of briefly touched on this before we went live, but... I have realised that my brother, Gary's character, my brother Graham, mm. looking after Barry before he was looking after um, Arthur. So actually he was my minder first. And I, oh, oh yes, yes. That's a badge of honour now. Yeah. Gary was great. Uh, and Heathcliff the dog as well. Um, I think the storyline was fantastic. Uh, and the idea that he was keeping it from his brother who knew all along and that he wasn't fooling him at all. Uh, and it was brilliant the way he, uh, you know, it was presented to us so that we believed that this brother was going to, you know, beat up Colin or New York. Mm. Um, and actually, it was, it was, yeah, it's up to, the, the only sadness I have about all of that is, you know, around that time, and you'll probably touch more on this later, there was Clause 28 was rearing its ugly head. There was mm. a kind of AIDS thing happening and there was some real negative bullshit about homosexuality and, and, and stuff. And Clause 28 was just insane you know this this idea that you you couldn't be seen to be promoting or or some other i don't know whatever and sadly the powers that be somewhere at some point kind of pulled the rug from under that storyline um I, I, and that was going to lead up to you know barry coming out to his dad mm. which didn't go as well and the guy who played my dad we we filmed some of the stuff and the guy who played my dad was fantastic absolutely brilliant um you know tore the hell out of the vic and it, it was a really really emotional really kind of powerful scene and unfortunately it was decided to cut that and all of that kind of stuff and, and it was replaced by uh if i remember right a, a very small scene with colin and barry in the square on a park bench uh, and it, it was just a shame. It was just a shame it was fun. And I kind of understand that people, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do something that's as controversial as, as and I'm not talking about Michael himself, I'm talking about the powers that be, that, you know, that they're all they're all kind of walking tightrope. They're all looking after their jobs. They're all frightened of this, that, and the other. And I get it. Um, but it's a shame because some of that stuff was pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, and it was pretty accurate from what I understand. Um, you know, everybody had really done their research. Mm. Uh, and, we, you know, you have to remember, we're going back to sort of 80, 87, you know, 35 years ago, it was a long time. Um, Do you know if that footage still exists? I have no idea. No, it'd be interesting to see now, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, it really would. I mean, it's, it's just, nowadays, you know, that storyline would just be not even given a second thought. And back well, then, it's everyday occurrences now, but yeah. things like EastEnders paved the way for what's happening now, isn't it? Yeah, I, well, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if that was the intention or, or whatever. It's certainly, I, I think the intention of 
making our characters believable and real and not cartoony. Yeah, not like not camp stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, up until that point, you'd had, you know, I'm with the greatest respect to, but John Inman and, and, and characters that you do in that era, you do tend to yeah. think of all gay men as being like that, though, don't you? Yeah. And that was uh, what I, mean, I was frightened it, off. When I first got the got the role, when I was working in this place in the West End, um, there were a lot of outwork actors and a lot of people, you know, doing various different jobs. And I, I actually sat and chatted with a a fair few people to just try to get a, a sense of people's experiences. And, and, and you know, it, it seemed to me at that point, the further up north you were, and, and this is at that point, the more difficult things were, mm. uh, the further down towards London, the less difficult, but it was still pretty difficult back then, particularly with people mm. uh, coming out to parents and stuff like that. From from what I was speaking to, I, you know, I just didn't experience that myself, but, you know, I spoke to a lot of people. Um, and it, it's changed so much now. And, and when you look Thank back and, and think about, you know, they cut that, it, it doesn't make any sense. But at the time, you know, I'm, I'm, I wish I'm they tired. I really wish they hadn't because I think it was very much ahead of its time. And it would have really educated a lot of people to what, you know, a young person goes through if they come out, male, female or otherwise. You know, to actually, at that time, it, there was such a taboo uh, surrounding homosexuality, and to some degree, this still is as as kind of it's still a, a kind of acceptable um, in some ways um, uh, for people to be negative and make jokes, and, and uh, it, it it's 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 still not a hundred percent in some places. Uh, no, definitely not. A guy not that long ago, we were just chatting, and, and East End is quite often comes up as people will know and remember. And he was saying he still, if his work found out, it would cause him problems. And it's like, we're in 2020. Wow. Why? Uh, and, and I guess the answer is, I don't know why. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go into any more detail through fear of identifying who that person is. Because okay. Um, but I have to say I, that shocked me quite a lot, that he is still, that that's too risky with the line of work. Wow and what he does that it, it just I don't think the employer would be the issue it, the people he works with would be right see things have changed but I'd say at a petty pace and we've still got quite a bit of a way to a bit of a way to go I'd say I, I think it's interesting I think you know if you take big cities M Manchester London Birmingham places like that oh, I lived in Manchester for 17 years I loved Manchester yeah so I think yeah, Manchester was a great place I, I was, oh it was yeah yeah um I spent lots of time in Manchester doing various things and I've, I've always loved it. It was a great time up there. But when you get further out to suburbs and smaller villages and places like that, mm -hmm. and towns. things are not quite, quite as um, tolerated necessarily. And people still have slightly more old fashioned views. Mm. In places. And, and you know, that, that all that will evolve and change. I mean, the thing is, Things don't seem to be getting worse. They seem to be getting better. So as long they as it continues and that trend continues, mm. that's fine. And hopefully at some point, you know, it won't mean anything. Nobody will give a shit, to be quite frank, which is what they should. Who cares? You know, yeah. what somebody does and who somebody loves or what any of that should not affect your relationship as a friend. Yeah, it doesn't define the person right. who they are or anything, does it? Yeah, the, your sexuality doesn't define you. Um, yeah. You know, there are, it's just a part of you. And why people want to still use that as a way to define a person, it, it, it's, that's just wrong. It, yeah. I, it's still, in some respects, almost one of the, uh, the last acceptable prejudices. Mm. Um, uh, it's changing, but it, it, it's not, you know, it's not all the way yet. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Well, on that uh, note, just to go back to a scene that you did where you told Dot that you and Colin were gay, because I put that on last week. Um, I mean, that was a brilliant scene. And then June Brown's, re uh, Dot Cotton's reaction. Um, I mean, June Brown's brilliant, so hilarious as Dot Cotton. She was quite funny. I have to say, Barry's reaction, because he wasn't nasty or aggressive to her, he, he was, uh, he was annoyed, but he didn't start being aggressive towards her. And I thought, well, that was a very natural reaction because... 
if somebody had been saying what Dot had said to me, if it was a bloke, I'd probably fire up and, you know, really like challenge them head on. But with somebody like Dot, I think I'd take the uh, Barry's approach, which was more the sympathetic approach. And I think, well, you know, what you've got to take okay. into consideration is, is when at that point in the storyline, Colin, Barry and Dot were friends. Yeah. Uh, she just hadn't realised and put two and two together. Uh, and I describe myself as naive. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, <laughs> and then that scene in the laundrette, I think Barry's kind of sh shocked that she doesn't realise and holding back because, well, he kind of likes that. And she's, yeah. Even though it's, it's upsetting. And I'd forgotten the kind of... It, it, it is almost... I, I kind of... Somebody wrote something about the comedy of it. On, on, and I kind of get what they mean. By, by, but... That comedy kind of work that keep bumping into each other and the horror. Um, I, but I also get where, where they were coming from. I get the kind of, you know, maybe that was, it should have been taken more seriously. But it's, it was, I, 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 I love that scene for loads of reasons. One of which, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, somebody told me they use it in schools to educate people. Oh, no way. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And that, just is just as cool as anything. Yeah. You something I did, you know. And there are a whole generation of new school kids know who you are now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't recognise me. Let's face it, people who know who I am told you I wasn't who I am. So. Oh, a lot of people say you don't look. I, I've got to be honest, the first time I looked, I searched for you on Twitter and I thought, that can't be him. And then I looked closely. Oh, it is. Um, yeah. I've not aged very well, clearly. No, but lots of people are saying you look better, but then I had to tell a few guys, and unfortunately, well, Gary Hales is actually straight in real life and married, I think. <laughs> I live with someone, yeah. Um, we're yeah. not married. Yeah. She won't have me. She's far too sensible. We've been together uh, since 92. Oh, wow, 28 years. Yeah. yeah, we met doing a pantomime. So we met kind of in a roundabout way as a result of EastEnders, because I wouldn't have been doing the panto if it weren't for that. Mm. Oh, yes, you would. Sorry. Oh, yes, you would, Carl. You had to get that one in, didn't you? <laughs> um, so that was, yeah, back in Christmas 92. So we're coming up to... Christmas 92. Wow. Ah, yes. Um, well, this is quite an obvious question. I think you've kind of answered it, but because obviously it was groundbreaking to see two gay characters in a set back in the 80s. Now, obviously, not that it matters, but you're, as I said, you're straight in real life. Were you a little daunted by that, which would have been totally understandable, you know, Playing a gay man, or was it your naivety? You just didn't see a problem. It was just like another. I'm game. really. People keep saying, "Oh, you were so brave. God, it was this and it was that and it was the other." And I just never ever saw it being a problem. And and be that naivety, be it whatever. No, Mark Burgess said the same, exactly the same really, as you. Who was really, played gay character in Brookside? I I spent six or eight weeks filming before it went out on air, and my first episode went out on air, and I remember it really well. Went out November the eighteenth. Yes, 1986. 1986. Yeah. Um, and I remember where I lived in uh, a road in, in North London called Fairbridge Road in Archway, where I pretty much grew up. And every morning I'd come out of the house before I, I, I drove up to L Street, which was about half an hour, 45 minutes away. And at that time, uh, there were builders opposite. And, you know, it, 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 it just, you know, eventually you get to that stage, you see people regularly enough, so it's just like, I'm morning, yeah, how are you doing? And that sort of thing, and it was quite friendly. Um, and the day after the episode had gone out, I came out of the front door to absolute abuse from these guys. I mean, like, you wouldn't believe the, the stuff they said. And I was kind of like, I, I didn't know whether to sort of laugh or cry. I was just like, I mean, not like, cry literally, but I just didn't know how to react. I wasn't oh. sure that they were serious even. I, and I just, I remember getting in my car and, and kind of driving up to Earl Street, just a little bit, I guess, shell-shocked. Mm. Um, it was just weird. I just, I, I hadn't even crossed my mind that people would be hostile. Mm. Or, or, or and, that, and it really was, it was quite vile and spiteful and quite nasty. Um, and it, it, the whole time I was in the show, you know, most of my experiences were positive ones. Um, by far, most of my experiences were positive ones. We, you obviously had people stopping you for autographs and stuff. Yeah, all, all of that. And most people didn't 
you know, the, 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 the who Barry was and the fact that they were gay were people were quite happy and so enjoyed and liked that idea and, and, and the Colin and Barry thing and the banter and the whatever. I, I you know, I think that, you know, for the most part, as I say, it was really, really friendly. And, and uh, there were a couple of people, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20, I don't know, over the two or three years that were just really hostile. I mean, I got attacked in my car. Um, by, well, I was going to talk about that. What happened with the attack in the car? I think I, you know, um, I just remember again, this is how, you know, I'm 21. Uh, the guy started shouting abuse at me in the petrol station. Um, like all sorts of bullshit and, you know, just stuff that you can... Queer and stuff like that. Yeah, and I mean... Well, I'm sure a lot worse, but yeah. We yeah, can leave that to you, you can imagine. And, and I'm not going to give it credence by repeating it. So it's just not worth it. I'd have heard them all and been called them all, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, 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 the guy was, a, you know, he was probably in his mid-30s, certainly, in my mind, old enough to know better. He wasn't a kid. Yes. Um. So, I, I think I had something like grow up. And I rolled the window up and drove out and got caught with traffic lights. And the guy started stalking over. He was very drunk. Um, and I, I lied. That was the point at which I rolled the window up. I thought, I'm not going to engage. Just not working. I rolled that, you know, that, put the window up. What I didn't think was to lock the car door. Oh, no. Open the door. And before I knew it, he'd kind of grabbed my neck and was, it, one thing led to another and the car was not Mac, it moving all out. I'm trying to steer the car and fight this guy off. And, oh, wow. A kind of crap at the, the uh, it was an unpleasant experience. Uh, Nightmare. Police ended up getting involved, and there was all sorts of you know, it's been written about many, many times, uh, in various places and stuff. And the real, uh, the real upside of that was the amount of support and nice letters that I got from people, and the support from the cast, and the support from Julia and Tony. Mm. Um, there is a there is still a scene in EastEnders of Barry in the middle of summer, I think I was going into the Dagmar or queuing up to go into the Dagmar, if I remember right. And nobody ever questioned why in the middle of summer, Barry was wearing a big scarf. Um, and it was because my neck was really badly bruised and, and kind of where he oh. put onto my neck and stuff. And, and Julia said, we'll just put a scarf around it, it'll be fine. And nobody ever questioned it, which was kind of funny. Wow, <laughs> you got away with that. <clears throat> yeah, we got away with that. but. Yeah, I got some great letters from people, um, very supportive letters. Um, the, the police were brilliant and really took it seriously and dealt with it pro appropriately. Um, I remember for a little while, again, where I lived in Favourite Road, um, newspaper guys outside and staying there overnight and waiting for me to come out and said, and I remember at one point, um, because I didn't really want to engage in that level and I didn't really want to get into that and I didn't want photographs of my you know, neck on my face or any of that. Because all it does is it's kind of almost encourage and, and kind of make a circus of it. I didn't, I yeah. Didn't that. And I remember I, I knew a lot of the neighbours really well and we went into the back, oh, I went into the back garden and I went over four or five garden walls to get out of a, a, na a nearby neighbour's house where there was a car waiting, which we've made sure was pointed in the opposite direction to the one that the press guy was waiting in. Yeah. Off I went, because I, I just, um, but it seemed like, um, I, I remember at the time, I it. it was really exciting and really good fun. And it kind of almost was, it was, it was <laughs> bizarre. But it, you know, EastEnders was, you know, it was front page news then. And anything Well, like you've mentioned a few of the, uh, the talking of the paparazzi, because this is uh, the next question. Um, oh. Actually, well, yeah, we've talked a bit about the, um, yeah. How did you feel when you heard about Piers Morgan, holier than thou now, of course, ever so graciously writing the headline EastBenders? Um, and he was one of many people in the media to be outraged by your story. I know that you showed me a headline, filth or something. I just, yeah. Tell us about I this just... press stories. First of all, what did you think about Piers Morgan? Uh, you know what? I... Press guys have got a job to do, and at the time, that was his job. You know, he was, how did Michael feel about that though? Was Michael outraged? I, 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 I don't know. On a personal level, I, I found it a little childish, I guess. Um, but I guess not surprising. I, I, was it just a general? Did you expect it was a normal? Because that was the kind of time that we were living in then. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, 
I don't really remember too much. I remember the filth thing really well because I remember Michael and I running around um, all day going, oh, filth, and, and kind of joking about it a little bit because it, I guess it's a way of dealing with it or something. I don't know. But I remember it kind of being funny. Although when I look back, it's not really funny. Um, and I, I hope in some ways that that has backfired by, by you know, I don't know, I, I, I just, the sun is the sun, you know, hmm. you either like it or you don't. And, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, you know, and the same with a lot of those newspapers, they sell because they know their audience. And at the time, that was a good number. That was a sort of headline grabber, clickbait, wasn't it then? And and I, th I think to some degree, and I hope to some degree that, you know, perhaps that might have backfired because I, I do think our characters were kind of well thought of by a lot of people. And, mm. and Liked, um, they were liked by the, uh, by the yeah, um, and and I hope that in some ways, you know, you'd never get away with that now. So you know, we yeah. clearly have, have changed in some ways. I'm not saying mm. that necessarily because of us or in spite of us or whatever, but that you clearly wouldn't get away with that now. No. Um, so things have changed. You know, I met Piers a couple of times around that time. You know, he, the thing is, he, he he was never a bad guy. I don't think he's a bad guy now. I mean, I don't watch his shows particularly. I'm not trying to stay away from the news and stuff because it just actually stresses you out. Um, but actually on a social level, he was, we, we did a kind of charity banner racing thing in Wembley or somewhere, I don't know where mm. it was. Um, and actually as just a regular guy, he was actually okay, really funny and, uh, and you know, he wasn't at all offensive or whatever, just. Well, I must just point out at that point that he did actually apologise for that because somebody dug that headline out. Uh, oh, it was. Oh, did he really? I didn't know that. Oh yes, and he did apologise. Um, I think it was last year on Twitter, um, oh, saying that he's very sorry. He knows it's not right, but it was different times then. Um, I've got to say, I'm not a fan of Piers Morgan, but I have liked the way he's been like. I, I, the thing about government. The thing about Piers is a bit like an actor. He plays a character, mm. and and I don't think that character is necessarily the man. And he's he's got a job to do, like we all have, and he's very good at his job clearly because he's very successful at it. Yeah. But, but I do think the peers that you see on TV is probably quite a bit removed from the guy who goes home to, I guess, his wife and kids or whatever. I don't yeah. know. You know. And of course, people like yourself who've met him, they're, it's only people like yourself that got a right to say things like that, obviously, because you've met him, you know what he's like personally. So I mean, I don't know what he's like anymore. TV, but, uh, don't we? Uh, uh, in those days, you know, I was, I was quite surprised when I met him. He was quite friendly. He was, you know, um, he just seemed like an okay guy. And it just seemed very detached from the person who may or may not have written that headline. Mm. And in fairness, I don't think I knew he was the guy who wrote that headline. And I don't know... If maybe I hadn't, I wouldn't have been as friendly had I known that. I don't, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it wouldn't have made a lot of difference. Like, a lot of that kind of stuff was water off a duck's back. Mm. If, you, if you let that stuff get you too much, it'll eat you up. Of course, yeah. It's really, really not. Because I know people were asking me about that headline today, and I'm like, well, it was 34 years ago. He's apologised. No, it wasn't right. But, you know, as you said, it's a long, long time ago. It, it's really a long time ago. Things were different. People's attitudes were different. And, and people... Oh, absolutely. Were differently yeah um and you know that's kind of part and parcel with you know michael and and, and then myself coming into the show and and that being groundbreaking starting something where people started to view uh view things from a different angle look at a different side of things and that's yes, how, to some degree we did um you know both michael and, and, and i's characters colin and barry were ordinary people who just happened to be gay mm. weren't, you know, I try not to think of them as gay characters. They mm. were characters yeah. and being gay was a part of that. And that was kind of, I think the, the way it would, the reason it worked mm. is because it never, that wasn't the all consuming part of it. You know, you, you had to kind of have something else. I mean, the, the only bit I look back at those clips now and I'm like, what the hell was Colin thinking of? You know, he, you know, he could have done a lot better. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, no. But yeah, I think there was I'm an sure Michael would agree. <laughs> with the age difference at one point, because at that point, didn't the police come round in a 
episode and they were more concerned at the fact that Barry was 20 and he was older or something. Oh, I, don't, I don't remember that. No? I know there was some, um, I, I know we celebrated Barry's 21st birthday after it was obvious we were a couple. Um, and I remember there being some kind of negative, because at that time, believe it or not, you know, you couldn't be gay unless you were 21. I mean, that would just laughable to think about now is just like yeah so incredible that in in such a short space of time you know you really you know and not long before that it was illegal period you know yeah but at that point you had to be 21 was the age of consent at that point so celebrating barry's birthday his 21st birthday on the show mm. was pretty brave um i think and pretty edgy and and there were some people that got upset because listen that that's their job to get upset and get offended and get uh, they all bent out of shape over something that really doesn't affect them but no know, of course but people do <laughs> you know, the merry white houses and and you have oh. a certain age to know what i'm talking about there i, I remember mary white house <laughs> those that don't, but google her you'll it, it'll be interesting but the merry white houses of the world that were you know everybody had to be this way mm. and not everybody's that way everybody's different mm. well again well because there were also there was a great storyline between you and colin um the aids storyline or rather barry thinking he may have aids and yeah, he came out negative so what was the, what was the reaction to that storyline well i again you really need to kind of look back uh, and realize we're talking you know 87 88 mm. And AIDS was, you know, people refer to AIDS as the gay plague. Only gay people and drug addicts got it. Nobody else did. Mm -hmm. And it was a death sentence and it was this, that and the other. And it was a new thing as well when yeah. you were doing that story. Yeah, it only just, it just reared its very, very ugly head around that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it actually, I think AIDS um, put back uh, and reintroduced the prejudices that were starting to disappear mm. before AIDS came along. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that my memory of it, I don't remember things being quite as nasty before AIDS as they seem to get after AIDS. Um, mm. And some of the, you know, I remember again, being in the West End, I went to see some friends of mine. I used to work in a pub many, many years ago. And I went in to see some really good friends of mine, Carl and Fiona had run a, a bar in the West End. Uh, and I remember getting some trouble in there. And that was from young guys, and it was all like fucking AIDS and uh, don't touch the glass and all this. Kind oh, of it was yeah. Just you know, it, it, I don't know. It, it, it was just weird. Looking back on it now, it's just odd. Surreal to be going to places yeah. and yeah. people that you don't know just suddenly shouting things at you and stuff. I can imagine but, it was scary as well. As I said, those those bad and negative experiences. Are, Far, far outweighed by the, the good and positive ones. Um, oh. it, just by, you know, most people, I think the funniest story um, and uh, was, I was in Earl Street. Um, it must have been, I, I can't remember at what point, it must have been in like 86, 87. It was kind of early on in Colin and Barry's relationship. Uh, and because he said this, it's all filmed in Earl Street, People who live in Elstree generally don't take a blind bit of notice of you because they see you every day walking to and from work and it's quite a friendly place and, and, and whatever. And I remember walking around there, they used to have a little Sainsbury's, I think it was. And I'd just gone there to get some something, I don't even remember what, some food of some description to get to get the shopping in my lunch break. And I remember being chased around the supermarket by an older lady who was much older lady with a French stick. <laughs> me off for being so bad to Colin. You, oh, I thought you were going to say for being really, it was it was really surreal. I mean, I just it, some people can't separate fact yeah. from fiction. But she, but she wasn't. She didn't have a problem with us being gay. She had a problem with me abusing his friendship, and I don't. I, maybe I, I Barry had, had some money or borrowed. I don't know something. Oh, Barry was always borrowed. Oh, she was really oh. angry at Barry and Colin's a nice. You leave him alone and stop doing this or stop doing that. And it was, I mean, I ended up leaving the store. It was just hysterical. She was really angry. I mean, really, really angry. Bless her. It, to her, 
full on real. She completely believed it. Wow. Uh, Oh, God. And I just couldn't stop laughing. I was, I just oh, you laughed at this guy. I was going to say, I, I don't I know what. I quite believe that it was happening. And I'm still kind of thinking of it now. I'm still looking back thinking, thinking, is this a prank? Is this a wild? No, she's actually serious. <laughs> People who were around were kind of like, not sure whether it was some kind of practical joke or whether, it, I, I still don't know now. I'm, I'm sure it was real, but it was <laughs> just surreal. It was, you know, very, very funny. But she was very angry that Barry was taking advantage, of, taking advantage of Colin. That was it. Nice Colin. Aren't you just Colin? Nice man. <laughs> now there's someone that uh, obviously took the show to heart. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was amazing. It was a show that many people took to heart. I mean, some of the letters that you get, um, and I'm sure... I was going to say, yeah, well, what, what were the sign LGBT it? community were very supportive of the storyline, I'll take it. Because I know I Michael's know. a big advocate for LGBT rights. I know there was some hostile stuff um, at one point, and, and a few people suggesting that the idea of a straight man taking the role of Barry was wrong, a straight man, whatever. Um, but that was soon kind of dismissed, I think, when they saw how it was played. I, I yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, it's, it's easy to sort of refer to the LGBTQ community now. That didn't really exist then. As, no. In the same way, because people were still so gar gar uh, guarded. You know, you would go to... Of course, no social media. Yeah, and you would go to clubs, um, but they were very specialist clubs, and they were very kind of... You know, I, I, I mean, I'd gone to gay clubs from, you know, when I was 15, 16. You know, Heaven used to have an actor's night. I think it was on Wednesdays or Thursdays, so you'd get a bunch of actors going down there, and, and you know, if we could get in, we'd go down, and the cabaret that was, uh, you know, I'd often go to Madame Jojo's, which was... Um, one of the funniest clubs you ever go. I had a cabaret every night and was a scream. Um, you know, despite being straight, that was never an issue with anybody. That uh, never a problem, and I was always welcome and friendly and, and great. It, it never was never was an issue before the show or after the show or or, or, or during. It, you know, I, I've never had a problem and always found. You know, JoJo's was one of the funniest clubs to ever go to. I don't know if you ever had the privilege, but it was hysterical. No. Cabaret every night was outrageous. <laughs> um, uh, it was, yeah, it's a very different time in that you never had that kind of community voice no. that you you kind of sort of have now, no. that, that of the community. You never had, and I think to some degree, um, and, and to give him his due, I think Michael's largely responsible for that. Um, and he will be, if he's watching this, and I really hope he is, uh, Michael. Oh, hi, Michael, if you're watching. That's really making me nervous now. <laughs> um, but if he is, he'll be sitting there going, oh, no. Because he's <laughs> modest and incredible and humble about such things. But he really kind of put his career on the line. Really, you know, there were two people who I really admire. Michael, because we're friends, and because I know what he did. And the other person is Jimmy Somerville, who I did get, the, <laughs> uh, I did get to meet once very, very briefly. I'm a fan of his music, by the way. Uh, I, I, I love his music, but him as a person. Yeah. I remember him chaining him to right, chaining himself to railings and really, you know, putting his career, it didn't matter. If, if he lost his record contract, if he lost this, that, or the other, he didn't care. He was doing the right thing. And Michael was the same. Michael, you know, along with uh, Ian McKellen, um, both vehemently and really worked very, very hard um, to right the wrongs that had gone on and, and to educate um, and, and not to dictate, but to definitely to educate and, mm. and people understand. Um, and that would be, you know, with Stonewall and all, all the stuff. You know, Michael has, has been a great advocate and a great voice for people in, in, in the LGBT community. Um, and always will be because he's... Oh, of course. And, and if he believes in something, uh, be that a person, a thing, a policy, whatever, he, hundred percent. In fact, two hundred percent. He will do. I've always loved his passion, and yeah, yeah he's a very get out and go for it kind of attitude. Yeah. Um, and I do think, to some degree, he is largely responsible for the fact that you do have a community now of people that oh, absolutely, yeah, talk to each other and are open. 
And, and I, I, you know, I put my hands up. You know, I, I remember I was, seeing him a lot over the years before I came out of the closet and afterwards. He was always a figure that I remember. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was never afraid to tell the truth. Mm. Nobody should fear the truth. Uh, the truth is the truth. And Michael was never afraid to, to fear the truth. And he was never afraid to call someone out on it. Mm. If somebody was lying or, or not saying something, it, he would call them out on it. And, um, yeah. He's a very honourable person. We, didn't, we don't agree on everything, like the same as you and I probably wouldn't agree on everything. But he's very honourable. And he won't... He will put a point across in a way that gives you a chance to understand and question and, and whatever. Uh, and, uh, he's achieved much more than he's given credit for. Mm. And he's a lord now, isn't he? Uh, uh, yeah, he is. He's been a lord for a while. Yeah. I know. Um, Do you call him Lord or are you allowed to call him Michael? I, I call him Colin. Oh, have... you call him Colin still? <laughs> Does he call him Barry? <laughs> He'd be horrified if I did that. <laughs> I still call him Michael. Uh, well, Michael, he's left the. I don't. He doesn't do acting anymore. Has he left the acting all behind? Has he closed the door and all that? I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure. I know he did. He sent us a year or two back. Um, I know we did. Um, about ooh, a few years ago, uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm going to get this all wrong. I think it was Gay Times, um, the magazine, had an anniversary, and they got Michael and I in for a, for a. a uh, something to do with the anniversary and, and you know our relevance to the character and they also did a big interview with Michael politically but they and they took us to out for a photo shoot uh just at the bottom of Parliament Hill fields just before we get kind of into the Hampstead part of it uh and I remember my girlfriend came along on the day and and she was taking some pictures as well and Michael and I were sitting chatting about stuff and answering questions Somewhat like today with you, you know, he did they had a list of questions to answer. And Sam said to me afterwards, she said it was incredible. She said, You were like an old married couple. Oh. One of them would start <laughs> answering and the other one would finish. And it was just, and I kind of look at I stood back at it now. And it was it was a lovely day. Um it, it was it was just crisp kind of autumn or, or spring. It was it was not too hot not to go. But it was a, a really funny day to be together. And it, it I've, I've known Michael a very, very long time. We don't see each other as often as perhaps either of us would like, but I've known him a very, very long time. And he's a really, really good guy. And he's the kind of friend that if you don't see him for a long time, it doesn't matter, you're still friends. When you do, you just, like you yeah. said, pick up where you left off. And yeah, we spent an afternoon chatting and talking rubbish and, and doing this interview for, um, for the magazine and, and stuff. And it just, or I just thought it was funny that, that, that Sam said it was ridiculous. You were just like an old married couple. <laughs> And I guess that relationship <laughs> evolved somehow from... Uh, well, the chemistry between yeah. you and Michael was spot on throughout, I have to say. Well, that, that, believe that, in the couple. well, I was in the closet. When it was being repeated in the 90s, I think I told you this on the phone a couple of weeks ago, yeah. but I'm sure lots of gay guys will say the same. Um, but I was watching those characters, Barry and Colin, in the 90s, when it was repeated, obviously, um, and taking it all very, very seriously, loving it. And uh, because there were no other gay characters on TV and suddenly it was like, oh, I don't feel alone now. There are other people and this is quite normal, really. I'm, you know, because being gay back in the early nineties, I mean, it was like a swear word or something. It's funny, I, I, I got a lot of letters from people who would say, um, and largely because, I, I guess, because Barry was the younger, of the two, so the, the, the less confident and established as far as their sexuality was concerned within the show. And, and I got letters saying that my character had given them, and that storyline had given them the confidence to come out. Wow. And, you know, I, I, I don't take credit for that necessarily because I'm just an actor, you know, performing the words that somebody well, else- You should, because I think that story but, promoted awareness and understanding. And, and, and it did, I don't, I don't I'm not just yeah. what the story did, but that, it didn't, I, I was just the tool that they used to get those words across. Mm. And and, I, and I'm really honored and, and really pleased and really proud that I got a chance to do that. And, uh, and, that and like 30 odd, day, effect, 30 odd years later, we're still talking about it. Yeah, and, and I still get, um, I still get letters occasionally. And I still, it's kind of funny because we were talking earlier about people who didn't think I was me because of Yes. <laughs> but then I'll walk around a, 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 I don't know, a supermarket or a store or something and I'll get people come up and go, oh, you're that guy. Uh, still, and I, I, I kind of can't believe 
that they remember it and that they, you know, this person who's now 55, who was 20 at the time, and they still associate that. Mm. I don't know what it is. So a couple of people have said your voice is very similar to what it was back then and still the same. Your voice is, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, the impact, the, the very fact that you just said, here we are 30 some years later talking about it, I, it's got a positive impact on me. Yeah. It, 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 it's, I, I don't know that at the time I realised quite what we were doing. And mm. it, you know, you're in a bubble when you do something like EastEnders because you're kind of protected a little bit from being in the show. Um, you're, you're protected from the real world. Even as far as I remember, some of the letters that you'd get sent to um to the studio were, were checked before they came to you so that they you know so you were you were protected uh to a large degree um and i don't know i kind of realized just how groundbreaking it was and and i realized much more later on uh, when people are still talking about it and still find what we did interesting mm. um and it's you know it's the only thing that i've done that people still refer to and and talk about uh, those scenes hold up really well. I mean, how do you find looking back on those clips? I just can't believe it. <laughs> it's like anything. If, if I showed you a picture of you at school right now, a photograph, you'd, you'd reel back in horror. Be, oh, my God, does that mean? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and, and, and that's the same for me. I mean, Michael hasn't bloody changed. He looks no, exactly I don't. the same. He looks Michael. exactly the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting watching them and it's interesting... I just, watching them with today's eyes, I just think they were really tame. Um, well, they will be, weren't they? Yeah, but I mean, I still like the old episodes of the, the, the Den and Angie era that you were in. Um, I think I said this to you last time. I mean, there was such a community spirit or something that, you know, it's not quite there anymore. I think I think that's got as much to do with... The Chinatown. In general, um, in that, you know, I remember I was a big fan of Moonlighting. And it was on oh, Bruce Willis, yeah. Monday night or something. And, you know, I couldn't wait to watch the next episode, which you couldn't watch on the laptop or stream or doing. You had to watch it when it was on or, or video it. But even if you videoed it, you had to watch it pretty bloody quick. Otherwise, people would spoil it the next day and tell you what had happened. Yeah. It's that whole water cooler television thing where people would go to work, play school, whatever it is, and talk about the shows they'd watched. Now... I mean, I've just watched um, Queen's Gambit, which oh, anyone who hasn't watched it, you must. It's on Netflix. It's absolutely stunning. But I watched that because somebody else had already watched it. And you don't have that group kind of... Uh, no, I know what you mean. Is it at the same time, you know, in the same way that I, I guess the only thing that's left now are, are live football matches, which I've got no interest in football whatsoever, to be quite frank, or the Queen's speech at Christmas. They're the only things that are kind of... Yeah, maybe the odd live gig or something. But yeah. otherwise, TV's become very uh, disposable or kind of you, you watch it at your convenience. But it used to be you had to sit down at 7.30 and watch it when it was on. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah, or if not, Sunday for the omnibus. And, and sometimes I do think, you know, 7.30, some of the stuff we did for Tuesday and Thursday, you know, 7.30 in the evening, that was kind of okay. I, I'm, I, I kind of find it amusing that we... It also went out on Sunday, the, the religious day and, and all of that at two o'clock. I think it was two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. And I, I, I think that probably was quite controversial for a few people on Sunday afternoon with our characters suddenly bursting into their family Sunday roast and them having to That's Sunday dinner. <laughs> what these two men are doing together and, and why they're, you know. The only, the only thing I kind of regret is that, and it's regret's the wrong word. It's not regret. I, the only thing I think is a shame, and and it's kind of, it's 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 soap operas in general and and, and dramas and stuff. You, drama in order for something to be entertaining, there needs to be a drama. There needs to be something. And it was a shame that it would have been nice if Colin and Barry had stayed together and been an example of, and and and, and just a lasting I, relationship. Yeah, a lasting or... relationship that would have been kind of nice. Yes, because they split up in the end, didn't they? Yeah, I, I, my character went off on a cruise ship to be a DJ, uh, so I'm not dead. Much so, a lot of people think I got killed or something. I didn't get killed. <laughs> no, yeah. he's still very much alive. He's still uh, on the gig. Yeah, um, 
but it, yeah, that would have been kind of cool uh, to to actually kind of have that um, that happen, and, and 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 would have been a kind of interesting and like quite a positive example, um, particularly because everybody back in in, in the eighties, you know, gay people were just promiscuous and they were this and they were all these negative things, and actually to some degree, you know, Colin and Barry's characters in the square became quite positive in many ways, particularly uh, Michael's character, Colin. Uh, was a very, you know, he was a pillar of the community. He was helping Dot with this and, and doing and helping people and, and stuff. And, and, and was a very positive role model, I think, that, um, for people in general, not just, and, you know, not just if you happen to be gay, but uh, as, a, as a person in general. He was a, Colin's character was quite a positive and a, a, a good kind of, I nearly said straight upstanding citizen, and I realised that. <laughs> No pun intended. You kind of know what I mean, and, and there really wasn't. But um, and and that was kind of cool. But that's the only thing when I look back. I think that's the only place where, if we were going to improve it, or could have improved it, or or maybe should have improved it, was um, that would have been quite a nice thing. But that's you know the benefit of twenty twenty hindsight. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think that ever occurred to anybody at the time. Maybe it did. I certainly wasn't involved in making those choices. Um, you know, you get a script, you do what the script says. Um, but it would have been nice. Yeah, it would have been. Um, because on reflection, I was going to ask, when you look back, what would you actually say were your favourite scenes? Do you have any scenes that stand out in your mind when you think back to your EastEnders days? <laughs> actually, driving with Anita was because that I was still quite early on into my uh, being in EastEnders and I was at that, at that point I was uh, my um, my contract was um, quite short the first contract that I had um, so I never I, I, and there was just something about being involved in that Christmas episode and then Anita was huge back then I mean like god you could, I can't begin to tell you how phenomenally huge she was as a, a kind of uh, and she sung the theme tune, of course. I think she did. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was kind of cool. Um, I guess the first day with Michael falling off his bike was was a lot of fun. Um, I think it's it's funny. There are just so many and different. You know, the the, the being the singing Christmas carols on. I, I guess it must have been Christmas Day in in the same episode. I guess I don't know. Mm. Later where, you know, there's this whole thing that Barry's going to spend Christmas with his family and Colin's going to be on his own. And Barry turns up, you know, um, late at night and buzzes the door singing dreadful Christmas songs and, and they spend Christmas evening together. Um, the whistling key rings always makes me laugh. I, yeah. I, some, I mean, I can't remember if, I don't know, Barry was always into something or other. Um, I, 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 I think I bought, I think, you, you could get a key ring or something. If you whistled, it would beep, so you'd never lose your keys. And I think yeah. that brought Colin for Christmas. <laughs> I've, I've subsequently seen those at various occasions, and it always makes me smile. And um, the scene where Colin discovers me singing "Build Me Up Buttercup," which my friend wanted you to find desperately. Oh, uh, I can uh, still find that out for you. Yeah, where I I can't remember why, but I got my own flat or something. And Colin, for some reason, whilst moving in, I left the door open and I'm wandering around the flat singing, build me up buttercup at the top of my voice or yeah. into it or something, I don't know, thinking I'm a pop star. And Colin discovers me. And um, the first time she saw that, and, and she's the reason why it, it's become a favorite of mine. The first time she saw that, I don't think she stopped laughing for about two hours. Yeah. <laughs> Her and her husband are really, really close friends of ours. In fact, they're who we spend Christmas with. Elaine and Steve, if you're watching. Um, I've uh, got to find that clip out now. Uh, yeah, and Cam and Jaden, because if I don't mention the kids, then I'll be really in trouble and they're very special and we get to spend Christmas with them. But she oh. literally, the first time she saw that, just, she could not stop laughing. <laughs> that, even just thinking about it makes me laugh now. I mean, <laughs> on her wedding day, um, she had it played so that we could dance, which I, I was just a really... Oh, wow. I think that may have been her first dance. I think her husband got the elbow from the first dance. I can't remember, but I remember, I remember her wedding day. I remember that being played and it just being very, 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 very good day. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't remember having a bad time while I was there. 
I don't remember, you know, and, and, and time helps with that because if I probably did, you know, I've probably blanked them out. You know, getting, you know, getting grief and, and the little incident in the car was, you know, unpleasant, but... If you had expected, yeah. if you knew that was going to come, all the abuse and stuff, or, you you know, you'd kind of, like, guess this is what's going to happen when I play this role, would you have still taken the role? Oh, yeah, I think so. I don't think... I mean, I, I, th I think if I had, had I known that was going to happen, the only difference would have been I'd have been more prepared for it. Yes. Um, and less naive. I don't think it would have affected me playing that role. Um, you know, I... I I, I still, you know, I, the play that I was talking about earlier, um, I did a thing called Wines and Spirits. Um, I played a gay character in it and I didn't think twice about it. It's like, who cares? But it was quite, it, it, it was a very clever play and it was about two people that worked, uh, did an act on stage together. Um, and it, I, the play was amazing. And when I read it, I actually went straight to Annie, uh, who's my friend and said, I want that role. I, you cannot give that to anybody else. I want to do it. And she did. Um, and it was one of, it was a fringe play we did at the Hen and Chickens and it, um, about two years ago, I guess now, um, something like that. And it was one of the, one of my favourite things I've ever done. It was brilliant. It was such a moving piece. And so, and it, it again, it, it, it's quite interesting when you look back to Colin and Barry and everybody being outraged by you know, these two guys having a relationship. And yet, by the time we get to do the play two years ago, that was not even a, a nobody even sure thought. It wasn't no. even a, it, it didn't even come into it. And in fact, at the end of the play, um, the fact that these two guys couldn't be together had, and I'm really not exaggerating, night after night, people bawling their eyes out. Wow. Um, and it just strong, powerful stuff. Oh, it really was. I mean, she's a great writer, absolutely great writer. And night after night, there would be a realization from my character as as to what had happened and what was going on. And uh, just I, I remember two friends of mine, Lee and Steve, coming to see it. Who are, uh, yeah, he says, whatever, come down and watch it with your friends and wives and stuff. We're all we're all friends. And both of them afterwards really slagged me off because they hadn't cried in the theatre before. And they're like, well, you're <laughs> And you made them cry. <laughs> uh, bless them. And every night you, you could kind of just hold it for a sec and you'd hear people as they realised what was happening. It would be like a slow burn and people would be sobbing at the fact that these two people couldn't be together. Oh. And it was that change. And I've never kind of really realised that until having this conversation with you. Oh, right. okay. years ago. So, you know, almost 30 years on from EastEnders, uh, when I left EastEnders, doing something. Uh, and, and the very thing that was controversial then is is kind of almost an also ran now. They, nobody, yeah. An everyday thing uh, now. I, I can remember, we, you know, things that were written about it. Nobody wrote, and the gay characters, or and the gay couple, or and the this. They were just a couple. And yeah, that, just characters. Yeah, and that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, again, and that definitely has moved on from the East Enders day, hasn't it? I hope so. I hope so. I mean, that's that's pretty cool if it is, um, and I think it has. I mean, but I, I, you know, I'm not even going to start to try and take any credit for that. I had a great time. I loved it. I love playing Barry. Barry will always be uh, a, a part of me, and uh, and a, a really lots and lots and lots of good memories. But the, I think that just was the kind of catalyst that started things and it's Michael and many others who took that ran with it and and really made a difference and yeah. now you can't have a soap opera without having a gay character it just wouldn't be acceptable yeah. and, 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 and back then that was just I remember people kind of I remember some close friends of mine at the time saying you know I sort of kind of saying you know this is what I'm going to be doing and um it's this, this, and this, and they were going, well, you're not going to do it. Oh, you're ruining your career. You'll never get another job. Um, and they were really, you know... Against it. I'll say, and, and, and in fairness, you know, when I left the show, um, I lost the job because I played a gay character. Um, wow. Uh, Can you tell us what the job was, or...? Again, not really cool. No. Because that wouldn't be right, and it wasn't the choice. 
it was it was a, a show that was sponsored and supported by a commercial company and um at that uh, at that time things were different mm. and you know commercially i guess they presumed that would have a negative impact on on their brand i don't know who knows um uh, the irony was that the person who got the job um was a gay guy um and did a very good uh, you know did a very very good job well but that is ironic though isn't it <laughs> yeah. but it, I, I think it was the controversial nature of of, of you know uh, around that sort of 87 88 time it was still kind of there was still a kind of nasty to, oh my god how unprofessional is my phone going Oh, is that your phone? <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought it was on silent. It's all right. But it's it's very different. It was it's it, because it's not just about you know I don't think it was just that he was a gay character, but it was also quite controversial. It was quite edgy. It quite I, I, I oh, came up with baggage, I guess, in Pensio. and it's that well, that's life. I, I, even that though. You know, going back to what you said, if if I could go back, would I change anything? No, nah, not really. Uh, um, you know, That's... it's it's not led to wonderful jobs here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, I've done okay. I st I still act. I still do stuff. I was doing, you know, as you point out, I did the, the the last season of Luther. And I've done a couple of other bits and pieces just recently. And in fact, just recently, I, I got involved with something. I got invited to. Uh, to do a, a play, a Zoom play. That's how I, I kind of, that's my only experience of Zoom. Wow. Which was quite an interesting experience, I have to say, which is, a, I think it's available on YouTube. I think, I'm not sure. I may not. Oh, wow. I should have to look at that. Um, but I, I wouldn't change a thing. I mean. I, well, there is one question I've got to ask you. I know that fans wouldn't, um, wouldn't forgive me if I didn't ask. <laughs> Would you, if you were to, if you were offered to go back to EastEnders? Yeah, of course I would. Oh, you would? Yeah. yeah Most likely. Well, EastEnders producers, are you listening? Get Colin and Barry back. That would be great to see them reunite. Not sure Michael, I don't know if Michael would or not. I don't know, you'd have to ask him. I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see Colin and Barry meet 30 odd years later since they <laughs> departed and said goodbye. Yeah, I mean, that would, yeah, of course I would. I mean, it's a great show. I've got, uh, you know, a lot of respect for those that do it and it's, I'll have to ask Michael that if he'd uh, consider going back. That would be great. It's hard work. Um, oh, well, of course. Well, it was two days a week then. It's four days a week now it goes out. Yeah, but there are more people now to cover those four days, so I believe. But, I mean, I imagine it's still as hard work now as it was then and vice versa. Hmm. It was great work. I, you know, I, there, there were days you would, you know, you'd get up to the, you'd get up to L Street at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning and you'd still be there at sort of 10 o'clock at night and, and time and then go back and do the whole thing again. But it was such a very kind of, uh, you know, a very supportive, you know, camaraderie thing going on and, and great scripts. And you knew you were part of something that was kind of special in, in one way or another, or I did. Um, and, and to some degree, you, I guess you don't realise that until you come away from it. Not like, until years later, until it's gone. Yeah. Um, until you see the impact it, it has and had, uh, you know, in its day. Um, and yeah, I loved it. I wouldn't change a thing. You've got to be kidding me. I've got to meet some wonderful people. Uh, I've got to have some great fun. I, I, and, and, you know, even doing things like this, reminiscing and thinking back, it's just great. And, you know, I did a show last year for, I think it was soaps, something, moment, controversial moments or something. And, and it's fun looking back and remembering. And and because it's, you know, I don't think about it very often. You know, I don't have any mementos at home. I've still got a couple of the scripts, I think, somewhere. Uh, so we did our loft recently and I found some and I, I sent a, a couple of old scripts to some friends of mine who were like, you know, just interested in seeing them. Um, but I don't really have any mementos and such. And so I don't think of it very often. So doing this with you and, and the lead up to it and seeing those clips has been, it's been kind of fun and, and interesting. And oh, good. I'm not, I haven't been annoying you then. That's good. No, no, no. I mean, and some of the comments from people have just been very supportive so kind and yeah. so generous um and and just i don't know it's it's it, uh, the whole it's, well it's so well remembered in people's minds i mean yeah. reading because i know michael cashman um shared that tweet today and uh oh there are loads of people commenting did you see the comments today uh, i haven't seen the comments today no because oh, there's lots of nice comments for you to read there. Yeah. um but i've that's i mean the there's a couple of things that I, I, 
I can't remember what it was now. I'd have to have a look, but there was something one person wrote that absolutely just blew me away. I really, really, I, you know, I couldn't believe what they'd written. It was just so nice. Um, and I, I'm not trying to be humble or overly coy or, or any of that sort of stuff. No, but it must be nice so feeling to have the work from 30 odd years ago. Yeah, still for be. people to remember that is just, and, and for people, as I say, some people have just been, I don't, I, I, maybe there has been, and I've been lucky enough not seen them, but I don't recall seeing anything negative. I think everyone. Oh, I haven't seen anything negative. Really positive. It's been nice to kind of connect with Gary again, who you're going to be seeing in a couple of weeks, and, you know, an excuse to connect with Michael a little bit. Uh, to some degree, because, you know, although we're good friends, you know, we don't speak on regular basis or all sort of things. We keep promising we're going to hook up. And, you know, he's busy, I'm busy. You know, you know what it's like. And nothing I do. And you don't do it. Um, but the whole experience has been kind of fun. And watching the clips, well, after getting over the shock of, you know, <laughs> 20, 21-year-old me, you know, probably carrying a little bit too much weight and, you know, no. care. Um you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's been fun. It's, it's been interesting. And I'm thinking, even sitting here tonight and going through stuff with you and talking about stuff that happened, you know, things are coming back as I'm talking to you. And I'm remembering different things that just, oh, you know, good. forgotten, but they're kind of buried somewhere at the back because, you know, it's 30. Well, you move on, don't you? You forget that yeah, those memories will always be with you, won't they? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's fun. And that's what I always come away from whenever I do anything like this or, or think about these things. It's like, I had a really, really good time. I was in it for a couple of years. Um, and it was a real privilege and a real honor to be part of that. And it's still now, you know, one of Britain's best loved television shows. Yeah. And I wasn't in it from the beginning, but I was in it very early on. Um, and it, I, yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. And, and, you know, I, I think I don't think that's wrong to be proud of something. No, you should be proud of it. Of course, you should be proud of it. Well, okay. On the final question, then, because I'm just interested, because I know it's a funny time at the moment in the industry as well. Um, have you got any um, current projects on the go at the moment, or have you, you know, what are your plans for the future? Mm, I, I don't have anything on the go at the moment. Um, there was something that was if but might be one of those kind of deals that was happening and then lockdown really kind of ruined it this ruined a lot of completely things completely finished yeah. that. that that got shelved and and i don't know that that's even going to happen now uh it may do i don't know um but no nothing at the moment from the acting side i, I you know i've got the proverbial and I always have had proverbial other jobs as all actors do because you've got to if you're not working you've got to still pay the bills um and i have a, a I lead a very diverse life. I, I, I run an organisation called the UK Garrison, which is a, a kind of, anybody who's interested, look it up. We um, we raise money by dressing up as characters and going, visiting to hospitals. And even that's all gone this year because we can't do any of that because... Of course. We're not a liberty... Now, that sounds like a good job. I'd like to do a job like that, dressing well, up as we, we we all fund it ourselves. We all buy all our own stuff and we all go... My Christmas... At, most of my Christmas days start by driving from London to Milton Keynes Hospital and visiting the children. And, uh, and then I go off to uh, have Christmas dinner in the afternoon. I meet my my uh, partner and her mum and we go and have dinner at our friend Stephen Elaine's house. And, you know, it's great. But Christmas morning, going to the hospital is just one of the most rewarding and fantastic things you could ever wish to do. Uh, and I'm really, I'm absolutely, we do that for... Um, uh, a, a charity, um, the Henry Allen Trust, and um, they supply all presents, and we get to give all the presents out to the kids and chocolates to the nurses and the doctors and stuff. And it's brilliant. It's such good fun. And then, uh, as well as all of that, I'm what they call a funeral celebrant. So that I, I kind of get to perform doing that quite a lot. Do what? Sorry, what are you? I'm a funeral celebrant, so I conduct. Oh, oh really? Um, which is a job that I kind of fell into. Well, fell into, that's the wrong word. I'd, I'd, I'd never, ever considered it. And I, I kind of, sadly, my my mum and dad passed about four years ago, five years ago now. And Sorry to hear that. I kind of, that, it, it evolved from that. It was a lady called Joanne who was arranging my dad's funeral and telling me about funeral celebrants. And I literally went, oh, I could do that. And she said, well, you should. And, and I kind of thought about it and I, I 
did the training, learned about it and did it. And it's, again, it's, it's such a rewarding job because you're helping people uh, and getting people through a time that's, that's not great. So I have a very, and I, and I still act, so I have a very diverse kind of mix. mix oh, it is. But I, I really enjoy it. Um, you guys a good balanced life. Yeah, I don't get enough of the acting work as I'd like, but then, you know, I still get stuff here and there and, and I'm fussy too. I don't want to just do any old thing. To be honest. No, that's good. That's good. Well, one last question I should ask you, actually. It's only a plan at the moment, but I've asked George Wilson today um, if he could, if he's interested in rounding up some people from Grain Jill to do like a, a Zoom interview thing. Um, <laughs> so would you Grain be Jill interested? Weird. Sure, yeah. I mean, I... Uh, Grain, Grain Chill is the only other show that people ever kind of get in touch with me about. Uh, and I still, I, again, through Twitch and stuff. So, yeah, I loved I, Grain Chill was a great time as well. I mean, a lot, a lot of fun. I spent 16 years at a regular, you know, school or whatever it was, you know, until I was 16 at a regular school, fighting like mad not to wear school uniform and getting into trouble because I wouldn't. And then at 17, I got a job where I had to wear school uniform. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to put your name down on the list then. So that's yeah, one person. I don't know. George Wilson hasn't said yes to it yet. Um, I mean, oh, I'll, I'll say yes. I'll do it. Yeah. yeah so you're definitely, uh, I'm putting your name down. You're on the list. My claim to fame at Green Chill is I was, the, and it kind of happened by accident. Uh, it was produced at that point by a guy called Kenny McBain. Um, and he noticed after I'd already shot a lot of stuff that I still had my earring in. And I was the first male character to have an earring in uh, Grain Chill and they kept it in from then on because it kind of worked with the character. Um, so I was the thought, I guess it's changed now. I'm sure loads of them have <laughs> first. And that was my claim to fame for a long oh, time. Oh, wow. Well, you're going to have to remember that story then for the yeah. next one then. So we well, are on the list so we will be speaking again then, won't we, in January? Uh, After I, Christmas. I look forward to it, mate. Yeah. Well, obviously, in the meantime, do keep in touch. And you've yeah, no, you know how to time. find me. You've got numbers and Twitter. yeah i need to i'll message you my when i get my new number i will message you my number yeah, but no, please do. And if really you get to, i will pass them on yeah well we'll speak before christmas but uh you have a lovely week and another evening once i what i'll do when i've uh, left here is um i'll download the video to youtube and then i'll start sharing it around to places so oh, expect thanks. some clips on twitter coming soon <laughs> <laughs> listen thanks ever so much and, and again really really sincerely thank you to everybody who, who made nice comments because they just they thank really, you really, for coming on you've been a great host a great yeah. guest i was just about to call you a host then i'm the host <laughs> you're a great you've been a great guest <laughs> i've really enjoyed it um, i look forward to it again as well so all right listen you take care thank you you much. take care I'll speak to you very soon and yeah, have a lovely I, evening how do i turn it off <laughs> oh yeah uh now, last time I did this, I didn't turn it off. I turned mine off, but I hadn't taught, turned George Wilson's off. So if you go to... Oh, I've got a button that says leave. Oh, yeah, there you go. End. I've just got oh, that. Yeah. So there. <laughs> okay.